Do you really understand how RTK works on your robot lawnmower? Uh, if you're having any bad positioning issues with your RTK robot mower or you just want to learn more, then watch this video. Yeah, hi everyone. Jason here, Robot Lawnmowers Australia. Today we're going to run through RTK or real-time kinematics uh, when they're used uh, to navigate robotic lawnmowers. So firstly, a bit of a disclaimer, I am not a GNSS or RTK expert. Um, we're robot lawnmower specialists. Um, we've sort of had to necessarily learn this technology um, with the new technology coming out on robot lawnmowers. So if I do state any blatant errors uh, in this video, please place a comment below. I'll be sure to acknowledge any errors I may make. So the content that I wanna cover in this video today uh, is mostly just the GNSS or the Global Navigation System, um, a very basic overview of that system and how it works. Uh, I wanna go over RTK and how that works. Um, basically look at the RTK base antennas like the ones on the table here. Uh, talk about the GNSS receiver that's actually on the robot itself. I wanna talk about the robot charging stations and locations of where to put those. Um, then we want to go through why a robot lawnmower uh, can actually have poor satellite connections um, and then what you can actually do about uh, fixing those poor satellite connections um, and then briefly want to talk about RTK robot mowers and some other technology that they're using to try and help them actually navigate through areas that have got poor satellite connections. So firstly with the GNSS, so GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. Um, there's actually four systems that are actually spinning around our world. Um, so there really is a lot of satellites actually up there. Um, all the four systems are all from different countries. So the first one, which is one of the original systems, which is GPS, Global Positioning System. Um, it runs 32 satellites uh, on six different planes on a medium Earth orbit. Um, and the orbit period is about 12 hours uh, for, that, for that system. Uh, the Galileo system, Galileo, Galileo system, I should say. Uh, European system, 30 satellites on three different planes, uh, medium Earth orbit again, and runs on a 14 hour orbit. Uh, GLONASS, which is a Russian system, uh, they run 24 satellites on three different planes, medium Earth orbit again, and about 11 hour orbit period for those guys. Um, and then there's the Beidou system, which is the Chinese system. Um, and that's sort of the most important one for us. Um, they run 44 satellites. Um, seven of those satellites are actually geostationary orbits, which means they actually stay in the same position. As far as we're concerned, that they're out in the sky all the time. Uh, they also run 10 inclined geosynchronous orbits, which they still orbit the Earth, but when they track, uh, for, for, what, for what we see from the actual, from the Earth itself, um, they basically do a figure eight um, basically all in, in front of us in, in the northern hemisphere and then they go to the southern hemisphere up to the northern hemisphere back to the southern hemisphere and as far as we're concerned um, when we see them from the from the earth um, they stay you know, in that same spot all the time just going from north to south uh, hemisphere in a, in a figure eight pattern uh, and uh, the Beidou system also has 27 uh, medium earth orbit satellites as well um, and most of their satellites are on a 24 hour uh, orbit period I believe so the reason why I sort of mention uh, the time period for each of these system for, for the system orbits um, is because this means that almost all satellites, they'll be in a very similar location in your sky from one day to the next at, the same, at that same time each day. Uh, however, over a period of eight to 10 days, they will move across the sky at your location at that time uh, until they repeat the same cycle again. So basically what that means is that um, take the, uh, the sort of, we'll take the 14 hour orbit uh, system um, and let's say at 10 a.m. in the morning there might be a satellite at this elevation here in the sky. At 10 a.m. the very next morning it might be over here. At 10 a.m. the next morning it'll be over here. At 10 a.m. the next morning over here goes all the way around its cycle, whichever which on whichever plane that's actually on. Um, but it goes all the way around its cycle, and eight to ten days later, again depending on the system, um, it'll end up exactly the same spot where it was the first day that you looked at it. And so the reason I mention that is because there is a pattern to how these uh, how the satellites actually orbit. Mm. So Australia being in the Asia Pacific area, um, the, uh, it really does help us a lot being where we physically are. Um, the Beidou system having stationary uh, satellites as well as the inclined geosynchronous orbiting satellites. Uh, 
that are basically either always in our line of sight or a lot of the time in our line of sight. And, uh, so that gives us a significant advantage over places like the USA uh, because these satellites are always you know, in our skyline. <laughs> So typically in Australia, at any given time, we can view up to 60 or 70 satellites if we include all the way down to the horizon, all the way around. So there's a lot of satellites we've got here. Um, if we exclude the first 15 degrees, so we bring that up to about here, so I think all the way around, we can still see around 40 to 50 satellites. Um, and we do that because typically your robot is not going to see the first 15 degrees from the horizon pretty much any time. So on these satellites, uh, there's like the, obviously they send signals. There's three main signals that uh, that we use to operate robotic lawnmowers. Um, first one is the naming signal. Um, so the, the satellite sends out a signal, and basically what that signal does is tells any device that's using it what satellite it's connected to. Then there's the L1 signal. Now this is a, a slightly older frequency, and it's the signal used to actually measure the distance. Um, and that frequency is not very good at passing through any objects whatsoever, any, any dense objects at all. Uh, then there's the L2 signal, um, and it's a slightly newer, newer frequency. Um, and again, it measures distance, um, and it can pass through some objects like light to medium tree density cover, uh, thin plastics and thin timber and things like that. So basically the whole system works on the time it takes for the signal to travel from the satellite to the GNSS device. Um, and the measurement of this distance is where the issue arises with accuracy in the entire GNSS system. So as you're well, probably well aware, is that general, normal sort of GPS systems, they're not very accurate, maybe one meter, maybe five meters, maybe 10 meters. Um, they're not very accurate uh, as a standalone system and that's basically because of the way it's measured. So anything that affects the time that it takes uh, for the signal to come from the satellite to the device is basically what causes the, the, what actually causes the inaccuracies uh, in the measurements. So the biggest issue here um, is the signal is affected when it passes through our atmosphere. Go figure. Um, the signal's slightly delayed depending on where it passes through the atmosphere at the time. So the atmosphere is different um, all, the way, all the way around and in different, different spots it actually takes a shorter or a longer period for it to pass through the atmosphere. So basically it all works by measuring that distance via time calculations and, tri and triangulating uh, the positions uh, of the device from multiple satellites. Mm. So lo and behold it's not actually that simple. There's plenty more other considerations to take to take into fact like the earth is not perfectly round for, to get started uh, but we're not going to get any, any, get deep into that. I just want to give yeah, everyone the basics of how the, the GNS system works um, so we can basically just sort of understand you know where and when we might have troubles and uh, when it comes to positioning of our equipment so RTK what is RTK so obviously it's like I said earlier it stands for real-time kinematics uh, and it, in very simple terms it uses a fixed location with known coordinates to help measure the time delays and then it uses this information to correct another location that's nearby. Um, once a fixed point location known by the system, is known by the system, um, it can then calculate what the time delays are in the signals coming from the satellites through the atmosphere uh, and then transmit uh, those calculations to another device. And then that device can calculate its own location with much greater accuracy. For the basic system that we actually use on our robotic lawnmowers, uh, that accuracy is down to around about one to two centimeters, which yeah, is basically enough for the robot to make sure it's mowing the grass and not your flowers. So this fixed point that we talk about, this is established by using another device called a base or a base receiver. So like these guys here on the table, this is Segway, this is, uh, is Luba. Um, now these still use the same positioning system as any other GNSS device, um, but because it doesn't move at all, um, uh, the, its position can be more accurately calculated over a period of time. The longer the base is installed, uh, you know, the basically the more accurate it actually becomes. Okay, so let's talk about these robot mower you know, RTK base antennas. The first thing I want to note is, as a robotics person, we typically have referred to the base station as the char or the charging station as a base station for all robotic lawnmowers. Um, now that we actually utilise 
uh, this GNSS equipment. Uh, we've had to change our, tech, our terminology quite a bit and we, we struggle with it, unfortunately. Um, but we now basically always make sure that we refer to the charging station as the charging station and not the base station, uh, because the base station now is really what we're talking about when we talk about the RTK base antenna. So what we've sort of done in our, basically in our industry and particularly ourselves here at Robot Law Miles Australia is that we now really do try and do our best to refer to the charging station as the charging station and the base or the RTK base or the GNSS base, uh, however you want to uh, phrase it, um, we refer to those as the RTK base antenna. So this antenna, um, it is the fixed point that your robot mole will take its calculations from to get a more accurate location. The placement of the base antenna uh, is absolutely the single most important thing that you need to consider when installing your robot mower. Honestly, you really cannot underestimate how important it is to really get these guys installed in the best location possible to help your system out. Um, they need to be installed in such a way that it can have a direct line of sight to as much of the sky as possible. You really do need, at a minimum, 120 degrees, which is approximately that. So you need about that sort of d degree of view, and 360 degrees around is what you need, pretty much as a minimum, uh, for these antennas. Um, and it's preferred if you can actually get it to be even more than that. Generally, we try and recommend that you get to around about 150 to 160 degrees, which is right down here somewhere. Um, and if you can, 360 degrees, but if you can't at least 300 degrees down to that level, um, then you really should do quite okay. Again, it depends on where the robot actually is mowing, but as far as getting that base antenna, um, try and get that installed. Generally, you're going to try and typically get it up on top of your roof, uh, roof of your house, roof of your shed, get it up as high as possible, hopefully as high or higher than the tree line or the bulk of the tree line that you've got around the, around the area, but you really want to achieve that, you know, preferably down to 160 degree view of the sky and at a minimum 120 degree antenna, uh, view of the sky. So these RTK base antennas, they also transmit another signal and they transmit that signal directly to the robot this time. Um, so that's basically sending the correction data that they, that they calculate, they send that through to the robot uh, and then that robot can make its calculation. So that signal that they send, it's typically some kind of radio signal and mostly uh, both of these guys here both use a 900 megahertz radio signal. Um, and that is fully capable of penetrating through walls and trees and alike. So there's no requirement for the RTK base antenna to have direct line of sight with a robot all the time. So this data connection between the base, uh, the RTK base and the robot is usually good for somewhere around 150 to 500 lineal meters distance depending on the make and model of the robot. Okay, so at the other end of the system is your robot mower. Um, so it has its own GNSS receiver in the robot um, and in surveying terms it's, it's called the rover. Now basically what they have uh, essentially is that obviously if you've got one fixed base antenna then the other one moves around and in surveying terminology they call that a rover. Um, for us we call it the robot. Um, now <laughs> The location, its location is obviously dictated uh, by your lawn as that's where it needs to travel every day to do its job. If it can't mow the lawn, what's the point? Mm. Now the robot will need to be able to see at least 10 to 15 satellites from every single location on your lawn or it simply just won't be able to navigate. This will either mean the robot will stop. If it can't navigate, it'll stop or it won't work very well. It might miss some areas under trees or in, in blind spots or it might even travel outside the virtual boundary area. And honestly, that can end rather badly if that means that the robot might fall off a wall or heaven forbid, it actually might go for a swim in your swimming pool or a pond or something. So you really don't want it to go outside the area that you want it to mow. To, to mow. Um, and to do that, you, the secret really is to have really good um, satellite connections. And, so for your robot to be able to get a rough position, uh, it'll need to get a good GNS signal, a good GNS signal from at least five satellites that are dispersed you know, throughout in different, different directions in the sky. Um, so typically for any uh, robot on the ground to get five good connections, it really, again, needs to be connected to around 10 or 15 satellites to get that. And, and they can't be blocked by too much. And so the big catch here is that the robot needs to connect 
not only to satellites, but it needs to connect to the same satellites as what the RTK base antenna is connected to. Hence why I said it's very, very important on where you actually locate the base antenna and to try and get that much wider angle of the sky wherever possible for the base antenna so that it can see the same, ro same satellites that the robot can actually see. Hmm. Okay, on to the robot's charging station location. Um, this really is another very important aspect uh, for people to understand. Way too many customers think it's okay to install this under a roof or in a breezeway, under a pergola, or some, some people even try and install them inside a metal shed. Um, it's just not possible. Um, sometimes you can get them to tuck under a roof a little bit, but really not very well at all. The robot needs to have a good GNSS signal uh, when it's on the charger as well. Um, typically, most manufacturers will recommend that there's nothing to the left or right of the charging station for at least two meters, and some of them say that they don't want it within two meters of a wall. So that can be difficult. So let's be honest, uh, most customers want to at least install the base station, although, sorry, did it again. They want to install the charging station um, back up against a wall somewhere. And look, we typically don't find this to be too bad. We find it to be mostly okay. As long as there is little to no obstacles blocking the robot's line of sight to the satellites in the other three directions on the compass. So if, it's, uh, if we're blocking, if the, if the wall that it's backed up against is blocking the view to the south, then we would expect that the robot has a good, uh, on the base station, again, on the charging station, the robot needs to have a really good line of sight uh, to the south, the east and the west. Um, if it's blocked to the north and if it's blocked to the south, like I said before, it needs to have a really good view of the north, east and west area and you know, basically be able to see satellites dispersed through the sky and it should be okay. It's also recommended not to have anything above the charging station other than thin plastic or timber, so don't put too much above the charging station. So then why do RTK robot mowers get poor satellite connection issues? Well, this is sort of where it all gets a fairly bit more interesting. Um, like my previous point about the robot connecting to the same satellites uh, as the RTK base antenna, it's not always the easiest thing to achieve. <laughs> I'll throw a couple of pictures up on the screen here. So let's look at this drawing. Um, the RTK base is installed on one side of the house and it's located low to the ground. So it can't see the satellites that are, or it can't connect to the satellites that are blocked by the house. The robot, robot however, is on the other side of the house uh, and it can see its own set of satellites, but the satellites at the RTK base antenna is also blocked by the house. Um, so in this scenario, th that robot mower simply just won't work. Um, the robot's connected to one set of satellites, the base station's connected to another set of, set of satellites, just simply won't work. If we take that RTK base antenna and we put it on the roof of the house in the same installation, then you'll now see that the satellites, that it sees all the satellites in the sky. So it doesn't really matter now whether the robot's on one side of the house or the other side of the house, it's always gonna see the same satellites that the RTK base antenna can see as well. So that's perfect and it will work perfectly okay. So we call that, uh, we call these, the, these connections co-connected satellites um, and the system will only work on satellites that are co-connected. So any satellite that the robot sees that the antenna does not, doesn't get used. Any, any, any um, satellite that the, uh, that the base antenna can see and the robot cannot, does not get used. It just simply gets completely excluded from the equation. Hmm. So if we also look at the same house again, um, but with grass only on one side to mow, then having that uh, RTK antenna down low uh, on that side of the house worked perfectly fine. So you can see that it see, it's, it can see plenty of co-connected satellites. Um, it'll work perfectly okay. It's only when that robot goes to the other side of the house that it has a problem. So not only do we need many connected, uh, co-connected satellites, uh, the signal to the robot also needs to be a good signal and there's really two main reasons um, that you can get bad GNS signals. First one is that you know, either the base antenna or the robot is being blocked from seeing the satellites. Pretty basic, I guess. So any structure, be it a shed, house, wall, fence, um, will block the GNS signal uh, and it will block it either fully or it'll block it partially. Anything brick, rock or metal uh, will likely fully block the signal. Anything plastic, timber, um, particularly thin timber, um, will, will only partially block the signal. The, the partially block the signal. Get it right, Jason. Um, 
So remembering my point back at the start there regarding the L1 and L2 signals coming from the satellites, L1 signals don't penetrate very well, L2 signals will penetrate some things. But when it does have to penetrate something, the L2 signal will get weaker and weaker as it penetrates through things. So it can't penetrate through anything, that's for sure. So what blocks you know, the view? Trees, the very first thing, obviously, that, that we really come to, that, that we have on all of our properties. So let's look at trees. In general terms, if you have enough co-connected L2 GNSS signals, um, then most you know, robots will work perfectly fine. However, as the tree cover is greater and the density of that tree cover is greater, it'll start degrading the signal to the point the robot will either not work properly or it won't work at all. At Robot Lawn Miles Australia, we've sort of started, you know, basically sort of grading our, our tree cover. Uh, so we do sort of light, uh, light density cover like this. I'll put some pictures up here of some examples. Um, so in this example, that robot will work perfectly fine under a tree cover like that. The signal quality is strong enough for the robot to remain connected. Um, and mo in mostly the same manner as it would if the trees weren't there at all. Um, it really just comes down to those L2 signals again, which there's generally plenty of them. Medium density cover like this. Um, so this is where it starts to be just a slight question mark uh, on whether it will or won't work. Um, if the medium density cover uh, is not widespread spread over the property, um, then it's likely that it'll be okay. Um, but, if the, but the robot may not hold perfect lines under this medium density cover. It might get a bit wavy, it might miss little bits sometimes, but general terms it'll be okay. And if this medium density cover is widespread over the entire property uh, or over a good, a good portion of the property um, or it's really close to the, the boundaries of the, of the property, um, then how it works really depends on how many satellites it can be co-connected to and far more importantly is how strong the signal is between those satellites and the robot. Mm. High density cover, another example here. So like this, we generally advise that RTK will likely not work very well um, unless it's just one or two trees in the middle of the mowing area and nowhere near the virtual boundaries um, it might work okay in those scenarios but you know, this type of tree cover um, if it's near a boundary or it's widespread over the property then it's really quite unlikely that you'll get an rtk robot to work well it might work it just might not work well so in Australia, look, most cases we're really talking about gum trees in most cases. So most acreage properties that we that we deal with, uh, generally it's gum trees that are, that are the predominant, predominant tree that's out there. And they're generally very light density and all of the robots that we've tested under gum trees have worked perfectly fine. For extreme cases um, where we're talking about, you know, super thick, you know, tree coverage, so hedges, windbreaks, pine trees, that sort of thing that are really close together and really dense, um, we generally classify those as walls and we'll get onto that now. <laughs> so walls. Mm. Uh, if you have a single wall, um, basically like I mentioned with the charging station location, if you have good line of sight so the other three compass directions from a single wall, uh, then you'll likely be okay. Um, if you block two directions with walls, that's when it really starts becoming a problem. So with an L-shaped wall, so if you've got an L-shaped, internal l shape like this scenario, um, then the results can be quite mixed. Um, uh, it really does depend on how many co-connected satellites uh, you know, the robot and base are seeing and how dispersed they are in the two remaining compass directions that the, ro excuse me, that the robot can see. Um, and then there's also parallel paths to consider, but we'll talk about that a little bit further on. So generally, we find that L-shaped walls that are less than two meters high can be fairly okay. Now, you might still have some issues, but two meters high, not too bad, but over this height, it's very likely that there's going to be an area, as the robot gets closer to the internal corner, uh, the robot will, will, will slowly but surely either not work well or not work at all uh, as it gets closer and closer to that corner. Then, then we start talking about parallel walls. So if you've got two walls that are parallel with each other, um, and again, I'll put some, uh, put some examples up here, but it really does get worse uh, because you're now talking about blocking the GNS signal in two opposite directions. So we have a few general rules that we provide uh, as advice to our customers, uh, just to get them to understand that passageways uh, that are between two walls is the hardest challenge for, for RTK-based robotic lawnmowers to achieve. 
So if the walls are less than 2.4 meter, meters high, um, sort of 2 to 2.4 meters high, then we generally recommend that those walls need to be 4 meters distance between the walls before the robot will actually work well enough to actually mow the area. If the walls are taller than this, uh, then we start recommending around about 8 to 10 metres between those walls before the robot will actually start working sufficiently to be able to mow that area. Now, it's not hard and fast. This is just the advice we give people. Um, we're often proven wrong here in customers reporting you know, that robots are working perfectly fine with walls much closer than this. Uh, but like every poor satellite connection issue you get with RTK robotic lawnmowers, it simply comes down to how many co-connected satellites are seen, how strong the connection signal is between those satellites and the robot, and how dispersed the satellites are in the vis uh, across the visible skyline that the robot and the RTK have. So it always comes back to the same thing. It really does. It's how many, how many co-connected satellites, you know, how good the signal is, and how dispersed they are across the skyline. Hmm. So a good example of a negative scenario here um, is that overseas, uh, we, we found a customer there that had two very tall walls, about eight meters apart. Um, and in this example, um, the robot could not mow this narrow area. And furthermore, it was actually unable to even pass from the front to the back at all. So just have a quick look at that picture there and you'll see that, you know, in that scenario, you would sort of hope that you could actually get the robot to actually pass through. Um, but in that, in that actual scenario, that, that customer was unable to actually get that robot to pass through at all. Mm. So narrow passageways between walls are certainly the, the biggest, they're the, they're the biggest red flag that we see with customers uh, when they're asking us about RTK robots and, you know, and whether they're going to work uh, at their property. <laughs> so then there's one other um, sort of issue that affects uh, RTK robot mowers, uh, and this is multi-path or parallel path. So this one, not as well known by most uh, and basically invisible to see, but the effects are fairly significant if you actually are affected by this issue. Um, basically, I'll put a picture up here again, um, basically a multi-path uh, is where a single satellite signal can be received by the GNSS, re GNSS receiver um, or base um, from more than one direction. So this is caused by the signal path being reflected off another surface like a wall or other large reflective surface of some description. So in the picture, you can sort of see what I mean. Basically, because, because it's actually receiving that, that single path twice um, and the distances are different between those two paths, the robot or the base antenna, whichever it's actually being affected by this, it'll actually reject that satellite and it won't be used at all, um, which is one less satellite that you have to position your robot. So basically if it does start becoming a problem that's it really can be a big problem when you've got really tall walls and particularly reflective walls and large glass areas as well so mostly it's just an issue with those things so large areas metal glass um, and large painted or, or shiny painted walls um, but we don't see a lot of it but you do get this uh, quite a bit particularly when you've got two walls uh, that are close together so going back to the two walls and a narrow path between them so they're pretty much the main reasons why you can have poor position errors uh, or issues with your robot mower. So if you have any of these issues, what the outcome might be is that it might just cause the robot to not mow perfectly. And it might, might have perfect lines, it might miss little spots, uh, might do something like that. Um, or it might stop the robot from working either temporarily or permanently, so it could actually stop it altogether from actually working. It just stops and won't do anything else. Um, it could also cause the robot to go outside of its designated mowing area, which again, you don't really, really, really don't want that to happen. So most robots, when they're affected just minorly by, by, um, by satellite um, connections, um, generally they'll just sort of stop for a period of time they'll stop there and then as the satellites actually move across the sky and it gets better signal um, the robot will actually start up again and continue off and continue to mow. Okay so now what can you do about fixing this poor satellite connection or these issues that you're having uh, with poor satellite connections? From all of the above listed possible issues you know the first thing you really want to do is analyze what you think the reason is that you have you know that you don't have that you've got a poor connection you need to look at you know the positioning of everything and see where you think the problem might actually be now we use a satellite positioning app called gnss view now 
it's really good and I'll put a little bit of picture up here on the screen as well of it as well. Um, but it's an incredibly helpful tool to help you understand where the satellites are in relation to your actual location. So with the app, you can simply just view on a live directional screen, which has got a compass on it so you can direct it around um, where the satellites are from where you're standing uh, at that point of time. Um, and you can also use an augmented view um, so you can physically hold the actual phone up and you can see through the phone where the actual satellites are and you can physically see if there's anything physically between whether it's tree coverage or walls what's between you and that satellite at that very moment and see how many satellites you can actually see um, then you can do exactly the same thing uh, at the location where your rtk base antenna is um, which then allows you to sort of cross reference what the robot can see and what the uh, base station can see and you can get a bit of an understanding of you know how many co-connected satellites you think you actually might have and how good that signal might be it's all still a bit of guesswork um, because the app does not connect to the satellites it's just physically showing you where those satellites are at that point of time the other thing you can do with that app is you can actually slide, I think it's over a 24 hour period, you can slide uh, the, the slider on the, on the screen and you can actually watch the satellites come across from the east and west and how they, and how they actually track uh, at your location. So you can sort of see where the satellites are you know, at what time of day as well. Um, not only at the period of time that you're at at that very moment. So it really is a very, very handy tool. Um, it can be a bit difficult to decipher exactly what it means and what's going on, um, but once you understand it and get a, get a good understanding of what, you know, what you're actually looking at with that app, um, it can really give you some really good insight on, yeah, on different locations of your property and particularly where the, where the actual robot is, you can sort of you know, you actually see yeah, what at what direction where you think the robot can actually see the sky and what's physically in the sky at that time. So it really is very helpful and it can help a lot. Mm. So chances are that if you're having these issues, um, then essentially expect the same thing again. There's simply just not enough co-connected satellites with a good strong signal and good disbursement throughout the throughout the uh, visible sky. Um, and that's going to be caused from obstructions between your robot or your base station. Uh, and the satellites themselves. So the only thing you can do is to decrease the obstructions. Um, so from the robot and the RTK base antenna uh, and their view of the sky. So basically you know, it needs to have a view of the sky. We can't move the satellites, so you need to move something else. Um, so you can move the RTK base to a location where it can see more of the sky. Again, it needs to be that 160 degree if you can get it, 360 degrees around if you can get it. Um, the more it sees, the more chance you've got of the actual robot having co-connected you know, satellites with the base antenna. Um, if the if the location where the robot has issues is heavily tree you know, has he heavy tree cover, um, then you know, in most directions, then you can trim trees, you can cut out branches, thin them out as much as possible, um, try and get as much satellite coverage to get through those trees as you possibly can. Um, and the last thing you can do. Um, is to test the robot in the affected area, but do it at different times of the day or night. So, like I said right back at the beginning, and again, it's why I mentioned the whole orbit thing. So, because most satellites work on an orbit that's roughly 24 hours or 12 hours thereabouts, um, they'll be in the same location every day at roughly the same time. Um, it's not entirely true, but it, as like I said, they, they do move across the sky over an eight to 10 day period. But from day to day, um, they're very close to how they were the day before. Um, so you can test the affected area. So put the robot in the affected area and test it every two hours for like for a two or even a three day period. Do it every day, every two hours and test it until you find a time of the day where it actually might work better than others. And look, it might not work at all, but it's worth trying. Um, if you can find a good time where it does work fairly reliably, uh, then you schedule the robot to mow at, at, that, to at that time of the day. Um, like I sort of said earlier, um, because we've got all the uh, all the Beidou uh, satellites that are fairly, they, they, they stay with us you know, quite regularly, uh, and some of them all the time, um, we are rather lucky and most of our satellites are really quite um, you know, quite synchronized with our, with our day. Um, so most of them are actually going to be in the same location every day um, without fail. So other than that, if you think your issue might be caused by a parallel path, um, then 
that's a bit more difficult. It's a bit difficult to fix that one and typically it's not practical to do so. Um, but the only thing you can do is you can, you can relocate your RTK base uh, antenna to the same side of the property as where you're having the issue with the, um, with the uh, parallel path. Um, and that all that's going to do is going to give you hopefully more co-connected satellites. Um, it's not going to fix the issue of the actual um, the, the satellite connection bouncing off the wall. Um, it's just going to maximise the amount of co-connected satellites um, so that you hopefully you can overcome the issue with other satellites. Um, but that still, like I said, it may not cause. It, it's not going to solve the actual issue of the multipath uh, signals. And, um, you can also try again doing the same thing again before test it every two hours for two to three days because again you know the satellites will only be affected by multipath at certain times of the day when the satellites at a certain position getting that multipath so other times of the day it might work quite okay and that's typically how we've managed to get most of our customers that do have any issues with multipath generally the different times of the day thing is generally is where you where you solve the problem or don't solve the problem because it can't be solved so it's it's it's, it's a question mark it really is always is um, other than that, you can try and reduce how reflective the wall is. Um, so it, that it really would work, but it's very difficult to achieve. Um, if it's only a smaller wall or something, you can cover it with something that's a lot more softer and textured, like an unpainted timber or something, and that will help minimize the amount of re reflection that the, the uh, signals will get. Um, and then after that, if you've exhausted all of those things, then the only thing you can actually do is exclude that area from your mowing area. Um, so if you can't fix it by trimming out trees, if you can't move the GNSS uh, or move the base station uh, antenna uh, to a better location, um, if you can't remove obstacles out of the way of the robot that, that where it's being blocked uh, with the view of the sky or like heaven forbid that you do have uh, parallel path issues, if it can't be fixed, the only thing you can do is exclude the area and not mow it with a robot mower, turn it into a garden or mow it another way. Mm. Probably not the answer you want to hear, but that's the answer. <laughs> okay, so the last thing I just want to touch on, and it's only very briefly, is that most, if not all, RTK-based robot lawnmowers, they always have some kind of other sensor in them to allow them to continue working in an area that might have poor GNSS signal or and, and you know, less co-connected satellites. So most of these robots use inertial measurement, so it's an IMU, a sensor inside the robot, and it calculates how the robot moves via how many times the wheels go around and everything else, and it calculates where it is pre, you know, based on where it previously knew it was uh, with its RTK positioning. So if it's got a location over here where it knows exactly where it is and it travels forward, it knows where it is when it's just traveling forward, and when it turns, it still knows where it is, but only just, even though, even though the, um, the, the, the robot may not be getting really good signal from a GNSS um, receiver, um, it still can know roughly where it is. Now, it sounds fantastic, and it sounds like it will work really well, but typically, all we really see is that the robots can travel in a straight line for a period of time um, without being affected by poor GNSS signal. Um, if, it's, if, the, if it has to travel too far, um, then the robot gets a bit scared because it thinks it might be coming close to the to the outer boundaries and it will stop. So that's sort of that. So that's the IMU side of things. Others like the you know, Segway Navi mow and things, they've got uh, visual cameras to actually keep the robot mowing as long as they can see grass ahead of them. Um, now that can be a fantastic thing. It can also be a bad thing uh, because if that uh, if that uh, poor connection to the satellites uh, persists past the boundary, um, then these, then that, that sort of robot will actually will actually travel over the boundary wire, uh, or if not, there is no boundary wire. Um, it will travel over the virtual boundary um, until it actually gets to a an area where it gets its GNSS signal back again, uh, and then it realizes that it's in the wrong spot. So. Some of these sensors work really well. Um, as I look, the, the camera uh, vision on the Segway is an absolutely fantastic tool, um, but it's not a tool that can be used very well when you have low, um, you know, low satellite signals um, in an area where the boundary can be can go where, where the robot can travel over the boundary. Uh, for other reasons, the camera is absolutely fantastic things. Um, there are also systems that are coming onto the market that use radar and LIDAR. We haven't had much of a chance to test much of that at the moment. 
um, radar is a sort of a reasonably good thing but again it's a short term sort of fix lidar is fantastic but there's a lot of question marks uh, in my mind about the longevity of lidar and because it's a it's a very sensitive product to lidar um, so we have a lot of concerns about where, whether they will or won't work and we don't know because we haven't been able to test them yet so hopefully further on we'll be able to uh, to test that type of technology with lidar um, but unfortunately at this stage look our experience has shown that if you do have poor signal areas that are more than just a small space where the robot yeah you know, more than what the robot can just drive two or three meters forward before it gets good signal again um, then yeah you know, it'll work perfectly okay if it can do that but if it's if it has to travel for a further period of time with it with poor um, with poor satellite signal then our experience has really shown that the robot pretty much will just stop yeah, it'll stop going, it'll think that it's going too close to the boundary wire and it will stop an error and you'll have to go and fix it. So in most cases, you know, a lot of these RTK robot mowers, they really do need a good satellite signal pretty much all the time. So anyway, it hopefully, um, as the uh, as we get you know, better firmware upgrades uh, to all these robot mowers that we already have, um, hopefully they'll start doing a much better job and they'll be able to travel for longer distances and you know, and know where they are um, when they're in poor satellite coverage. So that's all I really wanted to get through today, guys. Uh, I'm not sure how long this video's gone for. I'm sure it's pretty long. They always are. Um, if you do have any questions, um, yeah, by all means, you know email through to us or put comments below and ask us questions that's that's fine um, always happy to respond to, to people that put comments under our uh, on our videos um, there's a fair few things that i haven't touched on there's quite a few things that we've sort of there's a few tricks that we've learned to try and to uh yeah to get better outcomes with poor rtk signals or poor poor gnss um, satellite coverage um, but we generally reserve those for our customers so we can help our customers out so if you do want to get in touch with us by all means uh, send us an email at sales at robotlawnmowers.com.au uh, you can find out a bunch more information on our website just just look on our website at www.robotlawnmowers.com.au um, and you can check out our socials so just search for robot lawnmowers australia on facebook instagram um, all those sorts of places and check out our day-to-day -day interactions thanks for watching